prior to the First World War, Mussolini was depressed and was basically a tramp. He had long hair, he was unshaven, and he walked around looking pretty angry all the time. And the locals used to call him the man in black because he just wore all black. He was out of employment, and when he was employed, he got paid little. Uh, and as a result, he went hungry quite a lot of the time. And this it was this was the period where he got into more radical ideologies, such as revolutionary syndicalism, also known as anarcho-socialism, and Marxism and stuff like that. Mussolini basically was an anarchist, and he described himself as one uh, prior to becoming part of the Marxist party later on, just prior to the First World War. Prior to the First World War, he, he was doing journalism, and he ended up in Avanti, which is a well, the Italian Socialist Party newspaper, and he was basically the guy in charge of it. And he was writing articles about socialism, revolution, and so on and so forth. Then the First World War breaks out, and Mussolini has to make a decision. And it's a dilemma that would ultimately change his entire life. Prior to the First World War, the idea, there was basically two ideas in Marxism. One, that the revolution, which is what Marxists want, would eventually come along because the poor were getting poorer and the 1% were getting richer. The problem with this first theory is that even Marxists themselves realise that that's just not how it actually works. The rich were getting richer, that's true, but so were the poor. The poor were getting richer with them, and so the revolution would never happen. In fact, um, Bernstein, the guy who wrote the fourth volume of Das Kapital, who was the actual guy who wrote it, he looked at the evidence and was like, huh, wait a second, the poor have actually got twice as much food as they did at the beginning of the 1800s. So clearly capitalism wasn't making the poor poorer. It was, yes, making the rich richer, but the poor were getting richer as a result as well. And if you have a understanding of basic economics, it's obvious why which unfortunately back in the day people didn't know why this was happening but they realized that okay this isn't working so the alternate theory of the revolution was that there would be a giant war or there would be wars being fought and this would cause the workers to fight each other in a bourgeoisie made war and as a result of this they would realize or become conscious wait a second why are we fighting for these bourgeoisie we will rise up and fight against our masters and the revolution would happen. Well, it was this secondary theory that Mussolini was kind of latching onto because what actually happened was when the First World War began, most of the belligerent countries had socialist parties or communist parties and so on, and these were all pro-war. Lenin was pro-war, the German socialist parties was pro-war, British, French, you name it, they're all pro-war. The idea was that everybody would go to war for their nation and this would eventually erupt in a socialist revolution. The Italians, though, didn't go to war. The Italians didn't enter the war until 1915. So the Italian Socialist Party was like, no, we don't want to go to war. We want to be, we want to show solidarity with our international workers you know, around the world, and so we don't want to go to war. Well, Mussolini was there, and he was in charge of Avanti, the so Italian socialist newspaper, and he's like, this this doesn't this doesn't make any sense because every other nation has gone to war, and every other nation's socialist party have all rallied around their nations, and so what he looks at, he says, well, the class conflict, the bourgeoisie versus the workers. This isn't as good as the nationality group, okay? So he's he's like, well, nationality seems to be more uh, uniting than this class idea. What we what the lesson of the First World War? This is in 1914-1915. The lesson is actually nationality is. Unify, unification, this is unifying more so than the class. And so he says, if we are to have a revolution, 
then we need the nation, the, the, the workers to unite behind the nation, go to war, then they will become conscious of the class problem, and then they will rise up. So the idea was that nationality was more important. And what he says is that instead of uniting the workers as a whole, why don't we solve the class, class crisis by uniting the nation? And this is what the uh, anarcho-revolutionary syndicalists wanted, the trade unionists. Uh, syndicalism is basically trade unionism. The trade unionists in Italy were saying, well, we've got this class problem, we've got this bourgeois, you know, owner class problem and the workers. What we need to do is create a syndicate, a, um, a body of people, uh, of uh, a trade union, in order to unite both the workers and the bourgeoisie. So we can, we can solve the problem by having a big, giant trade union, essentially, which looks after the workers and the bourgeoisie as well. So this is the idea. It's like, okay, we'll have a syndicate. We'll have a syndicate. And Mussolini was revolutionary syndicate. So he, that's what he was like. He's like, actually, we could unite the nation in a body, um, in a syndicate, in a trade union, and solve the class crisis that way. And so going to war would actually be better because everybody would then be united by their nationality. And it's also worth bearing in mind that Italy itself was... Uh, it's, it, Italians aren't a race. They are, in fact a bunch of peoples brought together in a wider Italy. Italy had only been unified in uh, 1871, and so, well, roughly in the period before that. And so they really weren't unified at this point. And in fact, Mussolini was the one who actually unified the Italians, as according to Farrell, at least. So what we have here is a situation where Mussolini's going, the nationality and going to war is actually more important. Well, the Italian Socialist Party were anti-war, and so they kicked Mussolini out of the Socialist Party, which is interesting, because all the other Socialist Parties had rallied behind their nations in the war. Mussolini was going along with what everybody else was doing. It was just the Italian Socialist Party that were anti-war. They were the only Socialist Party that were anti-war in this in, of the belligerent nations. And so Mussolini was actually on the side of the international socialists in this situation. And yet he gets kicked out of the international socialist party, the Marxist party. So he gets kicked out and he looks around and he's thinking, OK, I need to find my own party, my own movement. He actually founds a movement, not a party at this stage. And so what he does is he goes to the syndicalists, the revolutionary syndicalists, and says, right, we're going to unite the nation in a well, in giant trade unions and this the idea was as revolutionary socialists had already basically spelt out and there were several movements at this stage which were all doing this trade union syndicalism body of the nation idea what we will do is we will unite the nation under a body um the body of the nation and this shall be called corpse body corpse corporation so we will unite the, the nation under one trade union, or 13, I believe it was, and we will. this will be corporationism, the corporate state. It was the idea of a giant trade union that would take over. Now, I know currently, we, when we say corporations, we actually mean big business. Well, that's not what happened in this era. The, the fascists in Italy were the ones who created the corporations, and they were basically giant trade unions from the revolutionary syndicate movement, the anarcho-syndicalists and so on and so forth, the, the Marxists. So the idea was simply, we would unite everybody under these corporations in a corporate state and thus end the class conflict and therefore unite Italy under one nation. Everything is in, in, in the state, nothing outside of the state, to quote Mussolini. And so Mussolini latched onto this idea and he took the names of his party and his movement from the revolutionary syndicalists who had already founded little movements all over Italy and they were called fascists. And so Mussolini founds his fascist party on the idea of these fascist revolutionary syndicalist movements. So I want to quote from Farrell here. 
but in fact the first fascio called initially the and i'm going to butcher this fascio revolutionary di azoni uh, internationalista had been formed in October 1914 by others, in particular by the revolutionary syndicalists led by Corridoni and Massimo Rocca. And what Mussolini did when he got into power was just drop the internationalista bit. Uh, so it became Fascio di Azoni Revolutionary. So uh, the fascist of action revolution. And yeah, that's all he did. So essentially, he just dropped the international part out of the revolutionary syndicalist movement, which was Marxist. Now, this also appeals to nationalists. So the nationalists supported Mussolini. It appealed to socialists because, yeah, we're going to end the class conflict. So the socialists supported Mussolini. And... So it was a uni unification of what they called the far left and the far right and also the middle. Um, and this was really painted as the fascist third way. It wasn't far right and it wasn't far left. The movement defined itself as either in the middle or kind of to the right. Mussolini never gave up his socialism. He says this, some, some of his dying words were, I am still a socialist. He, he is un unif unifying the whole of the front. And so he gets kicked out, he founds his movement, it, he goes to war, um, well, he goes to war first, then founds his, founds his movement. Uh, then, after the war in 1919, he founds his movement and he starts to battle with the the chaos in the aftermath of the First World War. Italy was just a mess at this stage, and there was revolution in the air, and inflation, the economy was tanking, the government was quite unable to sort the situation out because if they sent in the troops that would cause more problems because people would rebel and so what they ended up doing is going ah these fascists are able to fight these guys because they are yes they are nationalist but at the same time they're also for the workers and so we can rely on these guys and what ends up happening is Mussolini does protect things like the bourgeoisie the big businesses and so on but he also protects the farmers that have just taken over the new farms the new businesses that have just been um, syndicalized uh, by the workers. They've just been taken over by the workers. He goes and protects these as well because there's just chaos everywhere and, it, and Italy's just a war zone at this point. So his fascists go in, start beating people up and there's clashes on the street and so on. They break up strikes, which obviously isn't good for Italy as a whole, nor the workers and so on, and really sorts the situation out. And he marches on Rome and takes over, essentially. The king grants him uh, the government. Now, what's interesting is that during this first, in this first period of the 1920s, Mussolini is actually trying to solidify his control. So we can't really, for the first few years of his reign, he's not actually in full control. And even at the end of his reign, he's still not in full control um, because the king is still there. Like Italy is still a monarchy. It's like a constitutional monarchy, but with a fascist government. It's weird. Uh, and so the movement at this stage was revolutionary syndicalism, fascism. But then it sort of starts evolving. Now, Prokov has asked a question. I was wondering if you could elaborate on Mussolini and his evolution throughout the early 20th century. You mentioned in one of your videos that, paraphrasing... Mussolini of the 1930s wasn't the same as Mussolini of the 1940s. I know that he was instrumental in founding the fascist movement in Italy, but it it's never is explained how he managed to go from being the most celebrated person in Italy to being hanged in 1945. Mussolini was incredibly popular, as was fascism. This is the point of fascism. It was a popular movement because it united the left, who wanted... Uh, corporations, they wanted the body of the people, they wanted the working class, they wanted the end of the class conflict, they wanted all that sort of stuff, they wanted the revolution, and the fascist revolution appealed to them, but it also appealed to the nationalists who wanted a group of um, people all united and stability for the nation of Italy and so on and so forth. So this was a unification of both sides of the political spectrum, 
the old political spectrum because I don't agree with it. But the and then the centre as well. It appealed to a mass audience. So the fascists ended up being socialists and nationalists and revolutionaries and non-revolutionaries and conservatives and liberals and all this. So they all came together in one movement, fascism. And so he was incredibly popular because he united everybody. He also managed to stabilize the economy, stabilize the government uh, for the first time since the war, and really made the nation proud of themselves. They ended up going to war a couple of times, only minor conflicts in the 20s, but they, in a sense, a lot of people say that Mussolini really founded Italy. He, he finished the process that Garibaldi had started during the unification of Italy in the 1870s. So uh, Mussolini kind of makes the nation of Italy uh, out of the peoples of Italy. So that's where we're at in the 20s. But he was incredibly popular even in the 30s. Now, what's the evolution of this? When he, when it, Mussolini gets in power, he's, a, he's trying to... He's slowly gaining more power because he's not got a total dictatorship properly in the 1920s. It slowly evolves until he gets full power pretty much during the Second World War. So it's an evolution. He's never got totalitarian, complete control of everything uh, because there's always a king. And so while he does invent totalitarianism under the corporate state, um, really he's not got as much power as, say, Hitler has who completely dominates everything. Uh, Mussolini has to answer the king. He goes to the king every Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. He goes to the king and speaks to the king every single week of his reign, um, discussing policies and so on and so forth. Even though the king is a little bit passive in this reign, he still has to um, you know, get him on his side because the king is somebody who, even later on, as we see, is always at any point able to just walk in, get Mussolini gone. He can take Mussolini out. Uh, he has the constitutional right to do that. And that's exactly what happens in 1943, but we'll get to that. So Mussolini in the 1920s is trying to set up his corporate state, but he can't do it straight away because of the whole political situation. He's got to stabilise the government. He's got to sort the um, economy out, so on and so forth. But over time, it evolves into the corporate state. He really tries to develop the agricultural sector because if you've got autarky, um, if you if you stop importing, you no longer have good. You you in order to import something, you need foreign money. So if you want to import goods from America, you need dollars. So if you stop importing, um, you. I mean, if you stop exporting, you stop importing because you no longer have the dollars in order to do it. You know, if, if you sell something to America and get some dollars for it, you can then import something from America. Well, if you stop exporting or you stop importing, you end up losing out on this trade deal. You can't do it. So when Mussolini introduces this autarky policy, it stops the foreign trade or it slows it down considerably, which is good in some ways because it stops the, um, the world... Um, during the 30s and 20s, the world is really unstable with the economy. We get the Great Depression in 1929, and this kind of insulates Italy a little bit because it's not as uh, reliant on the world economy. So that's great, but uh, it does mean that the Italians have to grow their own crops. It does mean that they have to sort themselves out and be self-sufficient. So Mussolini's trying to get self-sufficiency on the go. He, do, he implements the corporate state. He has several corporations, which are bodies of trade unions um, throughout the industry. So there's a farmers corporation and there's a, you know, a in heavy industry corporation and so on and so forth. And this ends up being controlled by the state. And so you get the term totalitarianism because it's total control. Everybody's, everybody's part of the state or everybody is working in the state or you know, has connections in the state. And so the state is in total control, hence totalitarianism. And so everybody is working towards the state. The Italians are really happy because they're seeing people, you know, the state and the bourgeoisie and so on and so forth. These guys are list having to listen to the workers and so on and so forth. The workers feel like they're part of a nation now. They feel like they are being listened to. They feel like they're getting better wages and so on and so forth. Although the economy is still shaky. Obviously, it's the 1920s and 30s. Um, but overall, they're actually pretty happy with the situation. So Mussolini is really popular at this stage. And the few times he does go to war, in the 20s at least, 
he gets he, he gets really popular. By 1935, he ends up in Ethiopia, which I'm not going to go into politically, but he basically wants a colony in uh, in Ethiopia. This is really seen as popular by everybody in Italy because they're all like, yes, we're going to go to war, we're going to fight. And uh, they completely crush the Ethiopians because they've got a huge military and the Ethiopians don't. So they get they just win it. Uh, and they use gas and so on and so forth with Marshal Graziani. Um, but they end up winning that and everybody's really happy in Italy and it's fantastic. Mussolini is also popular because the he, by unifying the nation, the only issue he really has is the papal states. Uh, and the reason is because the church is against the idea of fascism because fascism is like a, a religion in a sense and the church is a religion and they don't like it. So Mussolini goes to the Pope and there's negotiations that come about and he ends up somehow making a, uh, an agreement with the Pope that, okay, fascism will become kind of Catholic, uh, sort of, you know, they'll put crosses in schools and so on and so forth and we'll tolerate Catholicism, Catholicism but at the same time we'll still keep the fascists going. But anyway, he manages to meet, reach an agreement with the Pope which means that all the Catholics in Italy are like, yay! So they end up being a supporter of uh, Mussolini. And really, uh, right through the 1920s, right through the 1930s, Mussolini is incredibly popular. He's a popular domestically, he's popular abroad. Um, Churchill is really impressed with this guy. There's even quotes from some of Churchill's friends think were Churchill's thinking, should I become a fascist? Um, some people are saying he's going... Churchill's going to become the fascist leader of Britain. You see other movements like Mosley in Britain where he's, um, you know, more inclined to become fascist. Uh, Hitler's not a fascist. He's a Nazi. There's a difference. But he's inspired by Mussolini's march on Rome. He tries his own march on Berlin, but on Munich, uh, the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, uh, and then gets elected democratically. Uh, but... He borrows from Mussolini as well, the black shirts, we'll take the brown shirts, uh, the symbols and the march can be down, the Roman salutes, which ends up becoming the fascist salute and then the Nazi salute, and also the Greek salute, because uh, <laughs> Greece was a semi-fascist state at this time. And so, you know, a lot of people in the world are looking to Mussolini and like, wow, uh, this guy, you know, he's done pretty well, he's unified Italy, he's... Um, sorting out the welfare of the people, he's sorting out the class conflict, and he's really a stabilizing influence. So a lot of people are inspired by him. Uh, Mussolini also is, along with one of the other countries, he was the first to recognize the Soviet Union um, because he's, while he is, he isn't a Marxist anymore. Really, he's still got that revolutionary socialism in the inside him, and so he sees no problem really even though they're not seeing eye to eye at the moment he sees no problem with recognizing the soviet union and so they end up basically by the mid 30s um at least prior to ethiopia Mussolini is incredibly popular at home and abroad when he goes into ethiopia though things start to go a little bit downhill internationally uh, at, th at this point, Mussolini is trying to retain the balance of power. He's trying to prevent another world war. And so what he's doing is he's playing off the British with the French and the French with the Germans and the Germans with the Poles. And the and, he, and he's trying to remain neutral whilst trying to get agreements and, and so on and so forth. And in order to keep everybody split, keep Italy aligned with one power or another. And effe effectively, up until Ethiopia... Mussolini is aligned with Britain and France, and he does not want a Second World War, and he doesn't want uh, the destabilizing influence of Hitler to drag Europe into a war. He's very, very, very critical of Hitler uh, when it comes to the Anschluss. He, Mussolini is very sort of adamant against the Anschluss. He doesn't want to unify Germany, and part of the reason is because of some Italians in Austria, and he actually wants a bit of territory in Austria, and also, he doesn't want Germany next door to Italy, uh, especially with Hitler involved. So he's very much against this idea. But unfortunately, due to the way that the international political situation ends up happening, he can't really stop Hitler, uh, despite attempts to do so. Now, when he goes into Ethiopia, this, even though Britain and France were great colonial powers and had many colonies, and in fact... Most of Africa was pretty much torn between the two of them, and then Belgium and Holland. But uh, 
they, they are critical of Mussolini going into Ethiopia. And the reason really is because popular opinion had slid away from colonialization and had gone against it. So basically, because Britain and France now had colonies, they were against the idea of colonies. And so when Mussolini goes into Ethiopia, it's seen as an aggressive move. It's not humane, even though that was the pers- one of the reasons for in, uh, imperialism was, oh, uh, we'll, we'll civilize the savage. And Mussolini saying, yeah, we'll civilize the savage uh, in Ethiopia. No, that's not accepted anymore. So going into Ethiopia actually pushes him away from Britain and France. And so he's no longer in their favor internationally. He's kind of at distance and at odds with them now. But he conquers Ethiopia. Then we have the Spanish Civil War uh, starting in 1936. And so Franco rebels against the new Republican government. The Republican government ends up getting supported by uh, the Soviet Union and other revolutionaries. Uh, And Franco is fighting to to stabilize that. Now, Franco is has been called a fascist, um, but I'm not of the agreement that Franco was actually fascist. I think he was more for just a nationalist, which isn't the same thing, but we can argue this, but Hitler and Mussolini didn't really see him as a fascist, but they didn't like the idea of the Soviet Union having basically a satellite state in Spain. Um, because they thought that might destabilize the situation. So they went and supported Franco, which is interesting. But anyway, so they end up going into that. Italy ends up going into Spain. They actually get defeated at one point. Um, And then it's found out that Italian troops are in Spain. So this gets leaked out because it's meant to be a secret. And so this, again, drags his international influence down with Britain and France. And so they're not happy with him anymore. And then... Hitler uses the opportunity uh, because Italy is committed in Ethiopia and then also Spain. Hitler uses the opportunity to Anschluss Austria, takes over Austria, which means uh, Italy can't really do much against it because they're like, we're not prepared for war now. So um, they have no choice but to accept it. Then the Sudetenland crisis occurs. At this point, Mussolini goes to Munich and speaks to Chamberlain and so on and tries tries, tries to prevent a war. He agrees with the Munich Agreement, and essentially, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but Mussolini is desperately trying to prevent a world war from breaking out, and he's also trying to get Britain and France on side, Um, but they're not willing to do so. It's a very complicated situation, but then when Hitler invades Poland, or is about to. Mussolini's begging with Hitler, please don't do this. Please don't do this. We don't want to go to war. We don't want Europe to end up in war. And it's not enough. Hitler goes to war. Uh, He actually delays the invasion of Poland because of Mussolini, uh, but he still goes to war anyway. Because of this, Italy remains neutral at the start. Mussolini comes out and says, we're staying out of it. And what ends up happening is the uh, Chamberlain, And the the British persuade the French to start blockading Italy as well, because there's no agreement with Italy. They've distanced themselves as a result of Ethiopia and Spain. They distanced themselves from Britain and France. And so nobody knows which side Italy is meant to be on. And so Britain persuades France to start blockading Italy. And so... Even though they're not at war, Italy's not at war at this point, they, they do it anyway, so Italy's economy gets hit, and the British and French don't seem to be that interested in Italy's joining of the war on their side. Mussolini at this point is again staying out of it, but he knows that he, you know, he wants to kind of have a strong Italy and conquer some nations and so on and so forth, so He's looking around, thinking, you know, what can we do here? How how do we exploit the situation? And he thinks, okay, if Germany starts losing, we'll join the Allies. If Germany starts winning, we'll join the um, the Germans because he doesn't want to leave Italy out of the war, and he also fears Hitler. If Hitler wins, will Hitler go south and strike Italy? And he doesn't want that because he knows his military is pretty dire and is not in a state of um it's a battle in the second world war and he knows this prior to going into the war he actually gets told by his 
ministers, if we go to war, we're not going to be ready till 1943. Uh, and that's industrially. And the, the military itself isn't going to be ready until 1943. So they're not prepared. They have uh, 3,000 planes, but only 1,000 of them are actually modern planes. Uh, they have very few tanks. They've got uh, around about 80 divisions-ish, roughly. I think they increase it to 80, but... Again, it's like half of them are under-equipped. They don't have enough... They, I don't think they've got any anti-aircraft guns or very few. The industry in 1940, I believe, creates uh, 240 tanks, which is nothing. <laughs> so Italy's really not prepared for the war, and Mussolini knows this. So he, he knows if he goes to war, it's going to have to be short, sharp, and sweet. It cannot be a long, protracted war. And so right up until this moment... Mussolini is really popular, uh, at least domestically. He's very, very popular. Internationally, not so much. Uh, he's actually fav Hitler seems to be happy with Mussolini, but he's there's actually um, a, a lot in his table talks. Uh, Hitler says Mussolini's been corrupted by the bourgeoisie, but overall, Hitler's more favorable than the British and the French. So the British and French blockade goes on until about 19, uh, April 1940, which is before Italy enters the war, um, and then it stops. But by that point, it's too late. The, the damage is done. Mussolini's moving over to the idea of joining uh, Germany because they seem to be winning. The fall of France happens, and so Mussolini's like, well, we're going to win this, so let's join in. So Mussolini only joins the Second World War because he thinks it's going to be short, sharp, sweet, and that the Germans are going to win it. It's not for ideological reasons. Um, Mussolini is against democracy. That's why he created a dictatorship. He didn't like the previous government of Italy because it was very weak. So he hates democracy. He hates bourgeois um, lifestyle. So he hates the British. He hates Chamberlain because he had an umbrella and a top hat and whatever else. So he hates Chamberlain. Uh, and he. so he's not really favourable of France and Britain anyway, but at the same time, he doesn't like nas uh, National Socialism because National Socialism is just not what not his style. Um, the National Socialists are all about killing the Jews and so on and so on, well, not at this point, but they're about hurting the Jews and, and getting them out of the situation. They're very racist. Mussolini, half of Mussolini's, well, not half, a good portion of Mussolini's government are made up of Jews. He's He's got a load of Jews in his party and um, there's thousands of you know Jews in Italy and not only that the Italian people aren't a race we said this before they're actually an, an, a bunch of races I guess you could say and nationalities you know or groups who identify as different nationalities and different races and whatever else so they're not a race so the Italian people isn't a race you know so Mussolini's not the idea of national uh, socialism at this point doesn't really appeal to him. Now, it is true that in 1938, Mussolini introduced uh, anti-Jewish laws, anti-Semitic laws. But when you actually look into that situation, it's it's not as clear cut. It's nothing like what the laws were in Germany. So as a bit of a brief thing. So in 1938, they introduced a few laws like Jews could not partake in the government, Jews could not be civil servants, Jews could not do this, that and the other. Um, but Mussolini makes it very clear, his version of what a Jew is, is bourgeoisie. He refers to the Jews as bourgeoisie, well, they are the same, bourgeoisie, Jews, it's the lifestyle that he doesn't like. And so, if you were Jewish in Italy, you could actually convert to Catholicism or fascism, either way, and if you did that, that's fine. You, you, you're no longer in trouble, right? Unless you were foreign and you came in after 1919. But if you were if you were in Italy prior to 1919, you could stay in Italy so long as you converted. And that's what a lot did, or they didn't. They fled, or they did whatever. But there was no real persecution of you know. There was no execution. There was persecution, and so on and so forth. But it was more of a spiritual thing. It wasn't really a racial thing. It was more of a religious and spiritual thing. They wanted, Mussolini wanted the bourgeoisie, he wanted the Jews to leave their old lifestyles behind 
and convert to fascism and or call it Catholicism, but more, mainly fascism. Uh, so that's why he introduced it. It was actually more to convert the people and unite the people. Again, it was just a, another fascist thing. It was like, we're going to unite the people by getting them all into the same religion, fascism. Um, so it wasn't racism in the sty same style as National Socialism, but it was influenced by what the Germans did. That's why it came in 1938. Even though Italy, even though Mussolini got in in 1922, the first racial law came 16 years later because racism and fascism aren't necessarily the same thing. Fascism is just quite literally revolutionary anarcho-socialism for the nation. So it's, it's not uh, racism on its own. But you can be a racist fascist. Um, potentially Mosley was, arguably, and the Christchurch shooter, which we won't talk about too much because apparently it's illegal now. Good for freedom of speech. Um, but he went from being a communist to an anarchist to fascist. Um, and Mosley did the same. Mosley was a uh, Labour Party person. He became a fascist. And why? Because it's just, again, instead of being international class, it's national end of class conflict, right? So it, it's not a giant leap. Um, so, yeah, that's why a lot of Marxists end up becoming fascists in their life. Uh, and you see this in Italy. That's exactly what happened. They, they started off as socialists, a lot of them, and they ended up being uh, fascists. So even though there are some similarities, in, uh, I guess you could say cosmetically, between fascism and national socialism, they're not the same ideology. And so Mussolini isn't really inclined to just jump on with Hitler. He could actually fight against Hitler if, he, if, if the tide had turned the other way. But because Hitler seems to be winning, Mussolini starts to, uh, to go to his side and then eventually joins in uh, in 1940 itself. So what ends up happening is Mussolini goes into France, <laughs> takes very little territory because the Italian army is just not prepared to, for war. And the French weren't, but they could defend. So they were able to defend. So Mussolini doesn't get much in that situation. He does go into uh, Egypt and takes about 60 miles of territory, which I covered in my uh, Operation Compass documentary. And then Graziani's army gets annihilated on Operation Compass. And so that didn't go so well. Uh, and that's where Rommel gets sent down to help them out. He goes into Greece and the Greek uh, military ends up pushing them back into Albania. <laughs> Because, again, Mussolini's army just isn't prepared. Now, there was, at the beginning, when Mussolini did go to war, the Italians were very, very happy to go to war. And it's really, that is the height of Mussolini's popularity. And from this moment onwards, it starts to go down. And I believe there's another question. Good old Craig Marshall again, who asks a lot of questions. In what way did the German occupation of the fellow tripartite pact members, Operation Panzerfaust and the Italian Social Republic, among others, drain the German slash Axis war effort? Following along with that, why didn't the Axis, who were already willing to attack their allies, fully occupy Romania and nationalize their oil? Well, Italy didn't have any oil at all. Uh, so its navy basically ground to a halt. Uh, it didn't have much coal, uh, very, very little coal, very little steel compared to the Allies and the Germans. And so when Italy enters the war, and it ends up being a long war, Mussolini just basically has to get on his knees and beg Hitler for help. And that's why Rommel, Rommel goes to North Africa, and he ends up basically... Uh, he just basically ends up in Hitler's back pocket. You know, he needs he needs German support in order to keep the war going. And so when Yugoslavia ends up revolting uh, and Hitler takes over, it goes through, it blitzkrieg's through the Balkans, Mussolini is saved in Greece. Um, but the situation isn't great. Hitler doesn't... Hitler's not super fond of Mussolini. He thinks he's bumbling. He thinks the Italian army is not very good. And he thinks it is a drain. The reality is, I mean, there's a lot of manpower that the Italians give to the war effort. 
They also have a, a reasonable navy, but it's, it gets grounded because of the um, oil situation. Mussolini doesn't take Malta because he thinks the war's going to be over there quickly, so he doesn't see the point of it. Uh, he doesn't take, he can't take Gibraltar, even though he tries to persuade, uh, along with Hitler, Franco to join the war or help out or whatever else, or let the troops go through it, Spain, but that falls through. And so Hitler's not very fond of Mussolini at this point. So Mussolini's not, not doing so well. Mussolini ends up sending uh, the army or part of the army towards uh, the Ukraine during Operation Barbarossa because Mussolini is anti-communist. He's not anti-socialist, he's anti-Bolshevik. There's a difference. He hates communism. And the reason is because it's too far in his mind, uh, along with Hitler. He, Hitler thinks the same. So the Italian army ends up in the Ukraine in, on the Don, gets destroyed mostly uh, in the Battle of Stalingrad as part of that campaign. The Italian army just really not doing very well uh, at all in any point. They end up getting defeated in Africa, but Mussolini is all about the Mediterranean. He thinks the Mediterranean should be the main theater of war, which is interesting because they've got no oil. They need oil, and oil is in the Caucasus, but Mussolini is very much adamant that the Mediterranean is the main theater, and this is probably because that's where the Allies are. The British end up winning in El Alamein. The torch landings end up getting into Tunisia, and then... Uh, Sicily and then Italy, so Mussolini's out for the count. He has to fight in the Mediterranean more so than the Eastern Front. Hitler's main war is on the Eastern Front, and so there's a clash of interest there. What ends up happening is the king and some members of the fascist party end up thinking Mussolini needs to be get out, got out of power, and the reason is because if they get him out of power, there might be a chance of seeking peace with the Allies, and so they say to Mussolini, they actually, well, the king says to Mussolini, right, it's time for you to go now. They shake hands. Mussolini gets arrested and a new government is declared. But this new government is declared without really negotiating with the Allies. So the Allies are in southern Italy and the Germans just walk in and take over. Uh, so Mussolini ends up getting broken out of his jail, um, essentially, and then he ends up back in power in this new state, this new Italian state in northern Italy. Now, here's the deal. A coup got him out of power, but it wasn't because the people rose up in rebellion and, you know, took over. No, that's not what happened. It was an internal coup. The Italian people were still pretty happy overall with Mussolini, even after his uh, getting out and him being put back into power in the north with uh, the Italian Social Republic, Mussolini is still pretty popular at this point. He's not hes not majorly popular, but he's not unpopular. He's just kind of like, eh, right? His popularity skyrockets in the 20s, in the early 30s, and then pretty much until the eve of the war, he's still very, very popular. Then it slowly goes down, but he's not unpopular at this point. But the point is, though, that Mussolini has evolved. 20s and 30s, he was, you know, a revolutionary syndicalist and then becomes more nationalistic and so on and so forth. But then, while he's been deposed of and he sat in his, uh, not jail, but we'll call it that, his prison, and then he goes to this new republic to found the new fascist state in northern Italy, what he does is he goes back to his roots. He goes back to his revolutionary syndicalism and goes, right, we've done something wrong here. We're actually going to rethink this through. And what he comes out with is this new constitution, this new uh, Italian socialist republic. Uh, and basically he wants to nationalize the industries. He wants to have a, a proper, not communist, but Marxist state in Northern Italy. Bearing in mind that while he was in power, the fascists nationalized 20% of the, the economy. The rest of the economy was in this corporate state, so it was pretty much under government control. When Clement Attlee gets in in Britain after the war, they nationalized 20% of their economy, the British economy. And so fascism's got a lot of nationalization going on, plus the corporate state thing. It really was totalitarianism, but the Italian Social Republic took it a step further. Now, 
<laughs> it's Italy in this new socialist fascist republic in the north in Italy. It, it doesn't stay. It doesn't have time to really implement its policies. It only implements a few, and then Mussolini ends up having to flee. Um, but the whole premise is still there. That you can see it. Mussolini's still a socialist that he was, or the socialist anarcho-syndicalist revolutionary that he was in the nineteen twenties and even earlier. So, while Mussolini perhaps evolves over time. There's, it's interesting because he stays, he goes back to his roots almost at the end. And so there's a lot of question of why. Why did he do that? Was he betraying the revolution? Was he not betraying the revolution? What the hell is going on? It's a huge debate. And for this, I'm going to recommend Farrell's Mussolini. Um, I think this is a very, very good book. I don't, the only warning I'd give to you is that he, he likes Mussolini a lot. And he also doesn't know what National Socialism is correctly. Uh, he basically says that fascism isn't what the left have painted him out to be. If I painted it out to be, it's not as terrible as that. And it's true because um, it, the Italians during Mussolini's reign, um, the only, the only, up until 90, the 19, uh, well, up until the Second World War, they only arrest about 12,000 people or 12,500 people-ish. And only a few of them end up dying and those that do are, are assassination attempts on Mussolini. So 12,000, 12,500, 13, even if it's double that, that's nothing compared to what the Nazis did, nothing compared to the Soviet uh, purges or the revolution in, in the Soviet Union. The fascist revolution was comparatively bloodless and was very popular. And so the left have tried to paint this as like, oh, it's evil and it's terrible. And it's like, no, they've painted it with the same brush as National Socialism. And as Farrell rightly points out, they're not the same ideology. They're not the same ideology. Now, that's not to excuse fascism. I'm still against fascism. Um, but even I have to admit, Mussolini's fascism is nowhere near anything like um, Hitler's Nazi Germany. And it's nothing like the Soviet Union in terms of blood loss. And it's certainly nothing like uh, Mao's or the Camarouge in Cambodia. There's nothing like the killing fields, right? There's no, there is no Italian concentration camps. There's no death camps. There's no, none of this stuff. That doesn't happen. And so really the fascism is not as bad as what a lot have painted it out to be. And Farrell rightly points this out. Now, what he does is says, it's nothing like national socialism, which it isn't. Uh, and national socialism is backwards looking and, and, and wants giant farms and all this other stuff. And it's like, no. Farrell, Farrell's argument of what fascism is can be applied to National Socialism as well, except for the fact that National Socialism is a lot more bloody. Uh, so in actuality, Farrell doesn't understand National Socialism, but he does understand what fascism is. And so I'm going to recommend the book. I think it's a brilliant book. Recent uh, to the historiography, only came out in 2018. Very, very much recommended if you want a lot more detail on Mussolini. So in 1944-45, um, Mussolini is in control of this northern state and he doesn't really have he doesn't have much time let's put it that way uh, the, the allies are slowly moving up Italy and the communists are gaining momentum now it's often made out in the early traditional historiography argument that Mussolini was deposed by a popular uprising and the people wanted a new government and stuff and it's like nope that didn't happen uh, it's a complete fabrication by the far left. Uh, the reality was that Mussolini was still pretty popular. There was a little bit of a strike going on and so on and so forth, but it was not like a... I mean, it was certainly not... You couldn't compare that to, like, you know, 1921 Weimar Germany where there's revolutions going on all the time. That wasn't the case. There was very little internal revolt. The people weren't particularly happy because of the way the war has gone on. Italy was split in two. There was that going on and Mussolini wasn't particularly super popular but he wasn't super unpopular either and the revolution that actually happened wasn't a revolution at all all it was is that there was a few partisans in the north who were communists uh, in small brigades and they're what caused the downfall of Mussolini what ends up happening is Mussolini ends up fleeing towards Switzerland his wife and children get there but he and his mistress do not they end up going quite, they end up stumbling quite random, randomly into a random uh, roadblock where the partisans, these communist militias, 
just one day decided, oh, we're going to make a roadblock in this town. They go down, they make a roadblock, and then suddenly Mussolini's there. And so they capture him. All right, Mussolini's trying to get to Switzerland. They end up capturing it. It's completely random. It, it was, you know, one in, one in a once in a blue moon sort of opportunity. It just so ad hoc, so random. It wasn't planned. They didn't know Mussolini was going to be there. It was just, we're going to make a roadblock. Oh, look, it's Mussolini, right? And so they capture Mussolini. Um, then they end up shooting him, even though they were told not to, but they end up shooting him. And then they strung him up a couple of days later, or the next day. Uh, and that's the famous picture you see where Mussolini gets strung up with his mistress. Interestingly, they were caught. Uh, they were sent outside to get shot. Um, and she was, she didn't have any underwear on because she wasn't... They were like, come on, get out. And she didn't have time to put her underwear on. So she was shot. And when they strung her upside down, her dress fell down and... They, re they revealed her. Uh, so she, they ended up having to uh, tie her dress up in order to uh, hide, which is interesting. You're like, revolutionary communists who are a, bit, a little bit prudish. It's like weird. Um, but the reality was this wasn't a popular uprising. Yes, people didn't like Mussolini, but they tend to be communists and they were a minority in Italy And so at this point. So this really wasn't a popular uprising. And, you know... Any of that stuff, that just didn't happen. The reality was that it was just a complete accident that Mussolini ended up in the hands of some random communist parts and militias. That's basically what it was. And so the debate is back and forth of was Mussolini deposed because he was unpopular and so on and so forth. Well, the reality is up until the first, uh, until, up until the first day of the war, Mussolini's never been more popular. Mussolini was really popular. The people were not against fascism because it was violent and evil and whatever else. Up until that point, they were all on his side. And arguably, they were still on his side at the end of the war, even though things had gone wrong. Uh, it was more of a, a, a party coup in 1943 and more of a random stumbling block in 1945 that ended up disposing um, Mussolini. It wasn't a popular, or he wasn't unpopular by that point, at least not to the extent that the left have often made it out to be. But that's the point. Politics, the, the old argument was that the communists and the Marxists are the best in the universe and it was all about representing the workers. Well, the reality was that the fascists represented the interests of the workers. The fascists represented the interests of the bourgeoisie. The fascists were the ones who united the nation. And so, yeah, they were actually pretty popular. Mussolini was the one who stabilised Italy. And that, you got to give him credit for, even though I'm certainly not a fascist and I certainly don't support fascism. I don't want anything like that. Uh, I'm a classic liberal, so yeah, take it with a pinch of salt. But the point of the matter is that no, fascism is not good, but for the time, it was good and it was popular for the Italian people at the time. And there's no real getting around this, even though the revision and Stalin or whatever painted everybody as fascist. Oh, you're fascist. It's like, no, the reality, well, everybody's a fascist in Stalin eyes. Hitler's a fascist. Mussolini's a fascist. Uh, Britain's a fascist. France is a fascist. fascist. Uh, the Americans are a fascist. And, well, technically they might be, but the point of the matter is that, no, fascism was everything. And so the reality was that fascism was actually revolutionary syndicalism on the national level. That's what it was. And so, no, this this idea that this, you know, the left represented the workers. Well, no, the fascists represented the workers as well. It was an alternate leftist movement because nationalism, if we go back to the French Revolution, nationalism uh, was, along with socialism, on the left originally, then nationalism got sent to the right because if you're a socialist, you're international. So obviously you want to paint your enemies as being on the far right. So nationalism became part of the right. But the reality is it's not. If you're a socialist, you believe in groups, class groups, people, you know, um, bourgeoisie. Uh, you're a feminist, so you believe in uh, genders, groups, you know, women and men. Uh, you believe, because uh, I'm a man, but I'm not men, you know, I don't represent males, uh, but some people think I do, I'm guilty by association because I'm a male, right? That's not, yeah, it's a group think. Uh, and so is nationality. Nationality is a group think. Uh, race is a group think. And so nationality isn't on the right at all. It's a group think thing. What's on the left, oh, on the right, sorry, is individuals. So liberals 
anarchists. These guys are on the on the right because obviously you know anarcho syndicalism is it's bizarre. Like we're gonna be anarchists, so no government, no hierarchy, no state. But then we're gonna have a trade union. Like no, you can't have a trade union. That's an organization. You can't be organized. You're an anarchist. You're against organization. How can you be anarcho? trade union stupid right and if you watch any anarcho uh, syndicalist videos on the internet you'll find it's just a load of rubbish it's like oh you you've had the revolution and now you're bringing in a federalist state you can't you can't do it because you're anarchists but anyway that's beside the point and so in my eyes at least fascism is actually part of the left it's just alternative left some people say it's in the middle fine whatever but it's not on the right. If the oh, well, let's put it this way: if you have centralization and state control on this side, and you have anarchy and or democracy and liberty for the individual, or as much as possible, because obviously there's a there's a, a you know you, you can it's a spectrum, right? Let's put it that way. Then fascism's over here. <laughs> there's no getting around that. It's not. Oh, look, fascism is democracy. It's like, no, fascism hates democracy. Oh, look, fascism is about the individual. No, fascism is about the nationality group. So it's over here, right? So if we look at it in that scale, fascism's on the left. But if you want to disagree and put it on the right, that's fair enough. I guess there is no right. <laughs> I guess democracy doesn't exist. How can democracy exist with fascism? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so I would actually argue that really, at least until the Second World War, Mussolini was very popular. And so the reason for his downfall was the war. And if Italy had remained neutral, or if it could have remained neutral, because the big fear was that Hitler might have gone south. Now, we know, hindsight speaking, Hitler wasn't going to go south, but maybe he would have thought, oh, Italy's not joined with me. Maybe they're against me. I might attack them. Real politic. So as a result, he might have gone into Italy. And even in 1940-41, the Italians are still building... Um, defences in northern Italy against the Germans. Uh, so even though they were in the on the war in, on the side of the Germans, they're still building defences in the north because Mussolini's always got this stab in the back mentality. Hitler might go south and attack me, and in the end he does. Uh, he sends uh, several divisions, I think it's eight, into Italy uh, to take him over. So Mussolini's always got to watch his northern flank, and so. You know, I would actually argue that Mussolini was very, very popular, at least until the Second World War. Uh, he was very popular internationally, at least until the Ethiopian crisis. And he always he, he only joined the war because it looked like Hitler was winning, <laughs> which was a stupid move. So Mussolini's downfall was joining the war on Hitler's side and not remaining neutral. Um, I don't think he could have joined the Allies because that would have been a thing. Uh, Hitler could have gone south then, but maybe if he remained neutral, he would have ended up like Franco, just staying out of it, which probably would have been better for him overall. So Mussolini was deposed because he joined the war, and he was never really that unpopular. He was unpopular in communist circles, but he wasn't unpopular with socialist or uh, nationalist circles, which made up the majority of Italy. And so was Italy a drain on the resources of Germany? Absolutely. Uh, the reliance on food, they were reliance on um, coal, steel, iron, uh, they were reliance on oil, especially, which was not good. They dragged Rommel down into the into North Africa, and, and really, if Italy hadn't got involved in the Balkans, would something else have happened? Now, I, I, the problem with that is that Yugoslavia still turned, and so Hitler would have had to go into Yugoslavia, but arguably... Greece would have been out of the war, wouldn't have come on the side of the Axis, and so that would have been neutral. There's also the other argument that Hitler went into the Balkans because he wanted to stop Stalin from going into the Balkans. He went into Romania uh, in 1940, I believe, August 1940, and so, or was it October? And so, and that was to basically take over the oil fields to protect the oil fields. And so Craig's question about why didn't they go into Romania? Well, they actually did. Now, why didn't they nationalize the industries? They actually kind of did. Um, Goering sent his oil company into Romania and took over. Now, the Romanians still needed some oil, so it, it seems unfair for Hitler to just go in and take over all the oil and take all the oil off them. That seems a little bit unfair. Um, but even if they had done that, it wouldn't have been enough to cover the deficit anyway. And what you've got to remember is that Romania was the second biggest Axis power on the Eastern Front. They sent in a million men onto the Eastern Front. Hitler needed those men. And if he had taken over, if he had uh, taken over 
uh, Romania, they wouldn't have had those men. So just marching in and conquering left, right, and center, it's not good, especially since Romania was on the side of the Axis, it's not good if then they conquer their Axis allies. So I don't think that was uh, necessarily po possible. But other than that, the main drain for the Axis was taking over France, actually, and Western Europe, uh, and Italy to some extent as well, because you need oil in France, you need, you know, trucks need oil. And so if you, what you end up seeing is that a lot of milk in France, for example, goes sour because they can't, they don't have the trucks now to get the milk to where it needs to go in order for it to be made into uh, other products like cheese and so on and so forth. So they can't, there's actually a food shortage as a result. You know, there's a food shortage in Europe anyway, but there's more food crises happening and there's food going to waste in France because they don't have the oil to supply the trucks and so on. I, I think it's. I think it'd be argued either way because a lot of manpower went to the Eastern Front from Italy and Romania, and uh, and while they did drain the resources, steel, coal, and you know things like that, Germany could afford to send to Italy. It, Germany wasn't really lacking in coal. Uh, it wasn't really lacking in steel, especially because the Swedish were giving them steel, and so that wasn't really an issue. The issue which plagues Germany throughout the war is food and oil. And those two things were what drained Italy. Having two or three, maybe four divisions in North Africa wasn't really an issue. There was more divisions in Norway. <laughs> uh, the, so having Rommel's Panzer Division or two there, that's not really an issue. And so I'm not convinced that Italy itself is the main issue here. The, the main issue is that Germany lo loses on the Eastern Front. That's the main issue. And having an extra two panzer divisions and maybe a motorized division or whatever there, I mean, could they have supported it? Probably not. So it's about logistics and so on. But no, I don't think... I think it would have been stupid for them to annex Romania. I think that just would have been silly because considering they, they went in anyway, and I think it would have been... It would have been better overall if Italy didn't enter the war, but when they did, it was probably more of a benefit overall. Um, but it, it can be argued either way. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to recommend Farrell's Mussolini. I think it's the best book on the subject so far that I've seen. It's very, very good when it comes to historiography and challenges a lot of the old traditional arguments. So I'm going to recommend that if you guys would like to read more and get more information on it. As I say, just watch out for his national socialism. I don't think he's got that right. Um, but the same arguments that I would make, that he was making with fascism, I would also make with uh, national socialism. You'll understand when it, when he gets to it, when you get to it. Um, if you want to ask a question, uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon and or Subscribestar. Uh, links in the description. Uh, recently, I figured out that last year, April to April, I spent £3,000 on books. Uh, 3000 <laughs> So I need, I need help. I need support because I'm going through books left, right and centre. Um, so if you can support, please consider doing so. But otherwise... Yay, uh, Mussolini, get reading it. It's good. It's an interesting book. Very, very, it'll challenge your opinions on it. So, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments section below as well. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.